Hello there. Earlier this year, the channel looked back in time to August 1967 by way of that month's Golf Monthly magazine. The video received quite a lot of comments and seemed to jog a few memories as well, so I thought I'd do another video in the same vein, this time going back a further 20 years to 1947. There might not be quite so many people able to remember that far back though. So what was the state of golf in the UK back in 1947? Perhaps I should paint a quick picture of the country first. The Second World War had ended less than two years previously. All countries involved in the war had seen a great loss of life, hardship and suffering, which would be felt for many years to come. I'm not going to focus on the human tragedies here, terrible though they were, but instead will touch on the economic impact. Britain, like many other countries, had experienced great hardship. Towns and cities had been bombed and there had been a great loss of life, both on the battlefront and at home. Large areas of housing and factories had been destroyed and huge debts had been created. The first task of peacetime was to get the country up and running again and to start paying off the war debts. Little things like the manufacture of golf equipment were a long way down the list of priorities. Let's go back then to February 1947. A new golfing year was on the horizon. Hopefully there will be some optimism for golfers. Golf Monthly, February 1947. Bit of rust on the staple, otherwise not in too bad condition. The first thing to notice is the price. One shilling, or five pence in today's money, doesn't sound a lot, but it was probably a lot of money back then. The cover features Leonard Crawley on the left, the winner of the President's Putter. This straightaway hints at the respect for establishment at the time as the President's Putter is an annual competition played by former and current Blues of Oxford and Cambridge Universities. It's held in January at Rye Golf Club. Can you imagine the winners of this competition, which is still played today, appearing on the cover of a current national golf magazine? Presenting the Putter is the world-renowned writer Bernard Darwin, who himself was a Cambridge Blue and winner of the President's Putter in 1924. On the inside cover, we have an advert for a national bookmakers, so some things haven't changed, although I do wonder if these will be banned in the same way that smoking was some years ago. On page two appears a cartoon which seems to suggest that Britain has helped to put the world back on its axis, but then complains that many countries are ungrateful by wanting more independence. We then see how the citizens of Britain are missing out on goods due to the country's export drive, which is required to pay off some of the war debts. On the opposite page, we have an advert for True Temper Golf Shafts, produced in Birmingham under licence by Ackles and Pollock. On page five is another advert warning customers that new shoes are still in short supply. Page eight shows us the great Henry Cotton, demonstrating his driving of golf balls into the sea before a select audience. I assume that the balls are floaters, as the caption says that caddies are out at sea manning rubber dinghies and collecting the balls. Opposite to that is an advert for Gradage Golf Clubs, perhaps notable for the fact that it only talks about tournaments won using Gradage Clubs, rather than any actual models or clubs for sale. Next we have a regular feature, Men and Matters a sign of the male-dominated world of that time. Under discussion we have, surprise surprise, the golf ball, and it talks about Canada's adoption of the US-sized ball. The US PGA at the previous year looked to gain worldwide agreement on ball size, obviously opting for the American 1.68 size if possible. I covered this in an earlier video should you be interested. And following this discussion on ball size, we have a, a little bit of a talk on the upcoming Walker Cup contest. Facing that is a full page advert for Ford Motor Company with the Ford Prefect on offer at £350 just over including tax and the Ford Anglia at just under £300 including tax. On page 13 we have an advert for the classic Dunlop 65 golf ball with Mr Dunlop there with his clubs over his back. On page 14 there's a paragraph discussing the beginnings of American golf tourism. 
Golf tourism to the UK has grown exponentially in recent years with visitors from around the world, but America still leads with Japan catching up. This has caused a bit of an issue for golfers in the UK, as the best courses have recognised that they can charge much higher prices than previously, and still receive enough green fees from overseas visitors. Green fees have now reached a point where the average UK golfer has to think very hard about whether or not he can afford to play an open rotor course. Coming to page 20, and Francis Wemay discusses the American team for the Walker Cup, which he will be captaining. Opposite to that, we have a joke looking forward to the day that the stymie is abolished. Although the gentleman will have to wait until 1952, which was the year that the stymie was finally written out of the rules. The stymie might not be remembered by the younger of you, but was a feature of match play whereby if the opponent's golf balls were more than six inches apart and the nearer ball was in the way of the further ball, then it was bad luck and the player would either have to play around the other ball or try and chip over it. On page 22, Leonard Crawley tells of the play at Rye in the President's Putter, and on the opposite page is an advert for George Nichols' Pin Splitter Clubs. And once again we have a gloomy picture of a short supply. I featured the Pin Splitter model in a previous video, should you wish to find it. Page 24 gives us some golf instruction, although to me it seems more like a random flow of disconnected tips than a carefully composed uh, piece of instruction. Page 28, here we have an advert for all weather trousers. Thank goodness for today's comfortable rainwear. And here on page 31, we have some adverts for greenkeeping. There were far more of these and it was a topic often discussed in the pages of the, the magazines at the time. On page 33 here, we have a picture of one of the holes on the famous and spectacular Cypress Point course. And over on page 35, we have a, a joke that's relatable by many of us. 36 is a, a feature called In and Out of London Town. I guess that this means happenings in the metropolis and in the rest of the country. Page 40 discusses the contrasting interests of the competition golfer and the club professional golfer. Opposite to that we have an advert for another uh, vanished ball manufacturer, this one the North British Company and their twin dot ball. Turning the page we have sporting commentary. Not golf at all, but in this case association and rugby football. The previous month had seen four pages dedicated to boxing. Page 50 and we're back to the familiar subject of changes to the golf ball. This time an article in the form of a questionnaire by Sir Guy Campbell BT. I had to look the BT part up, he's a baronet. However the questions posed are framed to give his views on the proposal to change to the larger American ball. Comically Sir Guy mistakenly gives the size of the American ball as being 1.58 inches rather than 1.68 that it actually is. Sigai then seems to go off in an argument in favour of the floating ball. Well, I have to agree here that a floating ball would do much to curb the ridiculous lengths currently being hit with the modern golf ball. Page 54 gives us the current and the future state of motoring in the country. And at the bottom of the page, a barely noticeable advert for pipe tobacco. On to page 59. Correspondence. If British golfers thought they had it bad, what about those overseas? Here, a letter from the Broken Hill Golf Club in Rhodesia, as it was then known, now Zimbabwe, in which the extreme scarcity of golf balls is highlighted. Page 60 is part of a series of professionals and their shots. In this month's issue, it's Jack McLean at Worthing. The picture caption mentions the clean, spacious interior. I'd suggest that this might be more due to the lack of available equipment to show than by design. Page 62 is an interesting article on the development of plastic heads for woods. It will be more than a few years until plastic heads became familiar that the likes of Spalding and Sparkbrook Golf would soon be proclaiming their advantages, especially in wet climates such as the British winter. Page 67 
is the miscellaneous. And in the situations vacant, the first thing to catch the eye is the call for young professionals to go to New Zealand to work in leading sports stores. That must have been a temptation to those looking for a whole new life. In the miscellaneous section, there's an ad for pre-war manufactured coconut fibre mats in as new condition. Nothing was being wasted. And below that, a service to take old wood heads bored for hickory shafts, plug them and re-bore them for steel shafts. Again, the need for thrift is evident, and perhaps also the lack of new wooden heads. On to the fixtures page. And hidden at the bottom of that page, the Ryder Cup is mentioned, although not by name. The venue had not been finalised and wouldn't be until August, and it would be played at Portland Golf Club in Oregon. The Ryder Cup didn't hold the same sway that it does today, clearly. And we finish with a couple of adverts. One for Top Spa Rum, and one for Dunlop and Rankin Steelworks. What can we say about golf at this time then? We must look at the backdrop of a country still suffering from the ravages of a Second World War that had ended less than two years previously. Its effects were still being felt and would continue to be so for years to come. Rationing was still in force for many household essentials and items wouldn't start to come off the ration list until 1948 when first flour and then clothing were derationed. Petrol and soap rationing ended in 1950 and meat would be the last item to finally come off the ration list in 1954. Many golf courses had suffered during the war too. A few had received hits from stray bombs and many had seen parts given over to food production but the greater issue was caused by the simple fact that the courses had been neglected to some degree due to the lack of manpower and money to maintain them. Add to this the need to use steel for rebuilding the country and for the much needed export drive rather than to make golf clubs for leisurely pursuits. And even when golf clubs were being made, many were made for export. And it's clear why golf and indeed most sports took so long to recover. Well, that uh, sums up the 1947 February edition of Golf Monthly. Hope you enjoyed it and I hope to see you next time. Bye.